So, hello everyone. My name is Bjorn Lo. Um, I'm a practicing urban farmer and a social change maker. I'm an Ashoka Fellow and a young leader of the World Cities Summit and a co-founder of Advil Garden City, a social enterprise in Singapore. Uh, my practice and research focus on identifying the value that urban agriculture brings to the communities of highly dense and food import dependent cities such as Singapore. My keen interest on how the shifts in social ecology and demographic changes and how the rapidly aging population presents a new opportunity for urban care farms to play a bigger role in the rejuvenation of cities. I've seen food gardens having the ability to build communities and to address social issues within the city. I want to use this as a basis of changing the way our society works and how people engage with nature and the environment in a more cohesive way through food. I've based a lot of my practice on philosophies on regenerative agriculture systems and sustainable design techniques. Always thinking about the closed loop cycle and always finding appropriate sustainable narratives in my design. From the materials I use to the native and endemic plants I grow and nurture. The intimate understanding of Goethe's metamorphosis of plants provide an understanding of how nature has designed its systems and its greatest strengths that one can possess is that of observation. The evolution of Goethe's scientific work had great influence on that of Rudolf Steiner and his theory of the living organism, an individual and a self-contained entity, where as much as it's practically possible, the needs of the various members of the farm organism being met from within the farm itself. This principle is proposed in order to develop resilience and long-term sustainability for the whole farm. The biodynamic farming movement gave rise to the later organic farming movement, further distilled down by Sir Albert Howard and Lady Eve Balfour, and in the later years brought to clear prominence by Rachel Carson's and the book on the Silent Spring. The history of the alternative farming movement was developed as a counter to the then growing industrialized farming systems, which were the main push for the massive growth of population in urban areas. Permaculture, an uh, ecological design principle that place attention on the system approach to designing productive landscapes. Permaculture can involve any number of so, sev several ecologically inspired practices in the design and development of systems. Edible Garden City is a social enterprise um, based in urban farming. Um, started eight years ago in Singapore. Um, we, we started with building and maintaining herb gardens. And today we have built close to 240 edible gardens all around Singapore for the likes of property developers, hotels, restaurants, schools, um, and in people's homes. Um, four years ago, we started our own closed loop farm, um, which we called Citizen Farm. It was uh, on an 8,000 square meters plot, um, 10, 10 minutes away from the CBD area. Um, here is where we practice closed loop agriculture where we take in food waste, convert that into organic fertilizer, feed that back into our organic farming systems, produce food for the local community. Uh, beyond that, on the farm, we also provide activities and workshops and events for the community. Um, and also, uh, we provide social impact elements where we employ adults with mental disabilities, um, like autism spectrum disorder. Together, we feel that urban farms has the ability and the impact uh, to create social change within the city. Urban farms can create environmental impact by dealing with the food waste issue. And urban farms can also um, create community bonding and engagement. Edible Garden City is going into a new phase where we are repositioning urban farms into urban care farms, where these urban farms will provide mental wellness services for our community, which is rapidly aging um, and using mental, uh, using urban agriculture as a way to heal our cities and heal our people. Singapore agriculture situation uh, is very different from many other countries. Um, Singapore is a small island. Um, we are 719 square kilometers uh, with a population of 5.6 million people. 
But Singapore in the past, um, post-independence in 1959, uh, we had 20,000 farms in Singapore. 25% of the land uh, was dedicated to agri agriculture. That was a, a, equals to 14,500 hectares of land. But at that time, our population of people was only 1.6 million. By 1975, we were producing 80% of our poultry needs, so chicken and chicken farming. We were producing 100% of the eggs that was required um, locally. And we, were, we had so many pig farms and we were producing 104% of uh, pork, and we we're actually exporting pork because we were self-sufficient in, in, in pork. In 1980, a lot of the farms were resettled from the north to the northwest. All the pig farms were phased out by 1989, um, so there were no more pig farms. Uh, and now in 2020, 700 hectares of our land is now dedicated to agriculture. That is 1% of our total land mass. Today, we import 90% of our food um, while we produce 10% locally. And Singapore tries to diversify our food imports from 170 countries, Thailand being one of the major uh, exporters of food to Singapore. This strategy allows us to ensure uh, food security and our food supply chain is, is, uh, is addressed. What we have seen um, in, in the last 10 years, 10 to 15 years, uh, is the change um, in, in the way Singapore has designed its urban greening policies. Our, our city is known as the garden city or city in the garden. Um, and Landscape policies and city, urban planning policies have been very helpful um, in ensuring that our, we have things like rooftop gardens, uh, vertical greenery and walls. Um, and this specific policy called the landscape replacement area uh, has encouraged uh, Singapore to be a lot greener and a lot more, um, a lot more gardens being built uh, all around. Uh, we have a green roof policy uh, driven by the National Parks Board. Uh, and, and now Singapore has this um, very ambitious target to pr produce 30% of its nutrition needs by 2030. Um, and we, we also have a cross-agency task force to tackle food security. But we have seen uh, systems, neoliberal food systems like Singapore, largely controlled by state-owned mechanics and large institutions, um, and coupled with a very small and marginal agriculture industry where only 10% of our food is grown locally. This positioning is further enforced by state investment vehicles that focuses on food security and investment into big agriculture companies. Here you can see on the slide, um, this has happened in the last, um, last two years. Um, these investments is one that is devoid of empowerment to the people on being able to take control and take charge of our food system. The mark of progress is presented in only one way today, and that is of technology, vertical growing, sensors, and automation are words that you hear a lot of. They are worshipped as a silver bullet to solve Singapore's looming food crisis. I've fallen into the same trap, as you can see from this spaceship-like photo in a shipping container farm. The need to take many steps back to re-examine Singapore's approach to its environmental and food policy. The almost complete loss of indigenous Malay food practices is now completely overshadowed by the eating habits of migrants and our global taste buds and the produce that were commonly grown and eaten pre-independence is now a scarcity in the local market. We want to look deeper in the, in the field of food sovereignty and this unique position of a city-state that is entrenched in the neoliberal age, providing a contrast for other food sovereignty movements around the world. Here is Mr. Tan. In him, there is a wealth of knowledge of 300 different local and endemic plants and herbs. Mr. Tan will soon lose his space to the new agriculture agenda. What Mr. Tan faced is the same threat and displacement 
currently facing multi multiple generation soil-based farmers in Singapore. Many of them have encapsulated generations of wisdom of our land flora, which has been growing on the periphery of their farms. These local endemic species create unique biotypes for insects and wildlife. If we do not provide a medium for this knowledge to be kept, there's a chance that it may be all lost. The deglobalization and return of decentralized community food system can be seen as a method of bringing back indigenous and native food. This is a contrary to industrialized and globalized food system that has seen farming dependent on the world market, which focuses on a series of monocrop and cash crops. The project will help look deeper into Singapore's community gardens and if these government top-down driven gardens have aligned and kept the planting diversity that has been a common feature in small-scale sustainable agriculture projects around the world. However, without our citizens' basic connection with our landscape poses a massive barrier in how we view our current relationship to the environment. I completed a couple of sessions. I want to share what we have captured um, uh, in some of the panels that we have done. Here is Sammy, a Singaporean living in Hong Kong, and she tells us about her relationship with food. Because I remember when I was a kid, you know, uh, or when I was younger, I went to Nepal and I saw my friends like plucking uh, fruits from the trees. And then I told them, are you sure like police is not going to catch you? Um, and I always share this example to kind of talk about how Singapore is so green, but we just don't have that relationship with nature. Um, and I think food is really like the most easy way to begin conversations and to get people thinking. Um, like I mentioned, you know, I don't think it's only about growing. It's really about the entire food system. It's about talking about food waste. It's also talking about um, our relationship with nature. Um, Food is like a really, really good way to get people to learn. Um, making it very personal is also often cultural, um, but then it also gets people to come together and share their different perspectives uh, when we're talking about bigger structural issues like food justice, um, food systems and sustainability. Well, me included, as I was growing up in Singapore, taking our garden city for granted, the nature of authoritarian political system have filtered down into how people engage with the landscapes. As Singapore transitioned away from agriculture, this post-colonial government built a modern city on the foundation of urban greening. Initial efforts to green the urban spaces of the city-state began in the 1960s with the Lee Kuan Yew administration implementing an aggressive tree planting campaign in the city centre and on rural roadsides. In 1967, the government formally launched the Garden City Programme to improve urban greenery and pub public cleanliness. As envisioned by Mr. Lee, a beautiful orderly landscape reflective of a disciplined population and a civilized country. The program's main motivation, however, was economic development as the greening of the city-state was utilized as a strategy to attract foreign investment. With the framing of the loss of connection within the largest citizenry in Singapore to its landscape, we're still very tied down with the aesthetics and I have found methods in which to show through the understanding of local and endemic plant species and knowledge learned from pioneers like Mr. Tan could help foster the better connection with the landscape. I've been able to curate a series of plants to form foodscapes that are engaging and regenerative, infusing colors, textures, smells to design a space that is interactive and immersive. This planting palette you see has helped guide my design approach. And I seek to use this to adhere with the political, economic, and social norms of aesthetic politics so that this approach can be easily understood, adopted by planners, industry professionals as a new normal. This is a compendium of just 10% of what we have um, of compiling the knowledge of our pioneers. However, the stark difference is still very evident in how this foodscape has developed. To some and the untrained eyes, this may look like a mess of green littered with colors of blue and pink. To some, this is messy and unsightly. But to others, this has been seen as a standard of introducing diversity and productivity into the city center. The future foodscape space may be the signal of the relaxing of the city state, 
a static control of the urban landscape. But at this point, these spaces are nonetheless entangled in static politics and the mindset shift is required. My first approach will be to work in the urgency to relocate many of these local endemic herbs from farms that are on the way out. This will include the saving of seeds, documenting the saved seeds, with taking pro propagation cuttings uh, from these gardens. My aim is to document as many of these herbs and plants as possible. The documentation process will form the basis of our understanding of the local flora, thus allowing me to be able to transcribe the knowledge into a framework for the design of foodscapes. These seeds and plants will be sowed and scattered into the downtown core of Singapore to allow for these plants to bring up conversations, to allow the com community to re-explore what they have lost touch with. This will form the basis of our seed bank, where we will create seed access and knowledge to the community. The intended output from this will be a series of curated workshops, art exhibitions, panel sessions, and conversations around the topic of seed sovereignty and food sovereignty. Finally, this will be open source and then will be spread around to regenerate uh, surrounding spaces. One such way is to encapsulate the knowledge and seeds into a clay ball. This preserves and protects the seed until they are exposed to the actual environment where water is present, in a way creating a seed bank using natural materials. When exposed to water, these seed banks germinate and act as a receptacle for seedlings to grow. This method, better known as seed bombs, is a novel way to litter the landscape with useful and productive plants and can quickly populate the urban landscape to maintain and save a specific species of plant that can add value to the environment and the community. And looking at other seeds as well, allowing us to understand how we can spread these seeds of local endemic plants, um, food producing plants all around Singapore. And this brings us to the next project. Uh, once the outcome of the re-explore period has been established, this knowledge and output will be used in the face of regeneration of districts. The knowledge and materials will form the foundation of how it can be used to empower the community of an entire district. The anchoring concept behind this productive longevity and how the foodscape plays a part in encouraging this will be seen in this project. The opportunity for green productive spaces to also address that into aging is seen as a major trend within the urban food movement as shared in a recent panel I moderated and this is Sarah, Program Director from Capital Growth UK. How important outdoor space and nature is, be, is now being recognised for our mental health. So, you know, one of the things that suffered along with the obviously, obviously physical health elements, what's going on at the moment is, is the mental health situation and how um, a lot of the evidence around the connection with nature is really strong at the moment. And, uh, and um, our national government is putting a lot of money into nature connections. So, you know, we, here we have this great opportunity sitting in the middle of all of those things, which is about urban growing, community growing, community gardening. And we use uh, design methodologies um, based around this concept called attention restoration theory. It asserts that people can concentrate better after spending time in nature. When we're looking at scenes of nature, natural environments abound with soft fascination, which a person can reflect upon is effortless attention. The proposed design and build of a restorative agrarian foodscape within each project leveraged on similar models that have been successfully tried in other societies under the term of care farming I mean, and with positive impact to the health and quality of life of older adults and benefits to the overall community. The effects of horticulture therapy among older adults have also been studied in Singapore and other countries and linked to positive health outcomes. Horticulture activities cover a broad perspective ranging from all forms exposure to nature and plants to a narrow focus on active engagement with plants. These activities have been shown to reduce depression as the garden environment offers a respite from the urban setting. In addition, besides reducing negative mood, horticulture also brings about an increase in positive dimension. Using methods for data collection, we, we have found a panel of uh, researchers, community food activists. The conversation which I moderated was to tease out the topic of food sustainability in one revelation. It's really interesting to see that with 
um, you know, agriculture being um, quite quite limited and imports coming in, we still we still have people um, going hungry at times. So much of food that's being wasted in Singapore, and then we have about 10.5 percent of our population who do not get their two square meals, two square nutritious meals. Let's put it that way. So this paradox is uh, something that uh, we want to create awareness about uh, in terms of food support. Uh, in our particular study, the National Representative Study that we just did very recently, we did find that there are uh, food insecure families, but we also understood that these food insecure families are not getting the food support that they need. What we also found was that individuals who uh, are food insecure are very reticent in asking for help. And the reason why they do not want to ask for help is because they feel embarrassed, they feel excluded, uh, when they uh, when they have to admit to the fact that they uh, do not have healthy, nutritious food to serve themselves and their families, or they also sometimes feel that the others need it more than themselves. How do we empower the citizens through a decentralized food system? Can really simply be achieved through the use of local endemic herbs and vegetables. And really, the hypothesis of the compounded benefits can be achieved as follows: you know, uh, creating productive longevity physical and mental well-being, financial well-being, cohesion, and food security. Within this canvas, I'll be able to collect more data that relates to the creation of restorative micro-landscape with soft fascination. This micro-landscape can for, become a source of micro-enterprises and provide micro-jobs around the district, introducing a new way to eat and consume, changing the ways the citizens think about their food, eating their way out of old habits and changing mindsets. If we can change this mindset, we can change the demand. And with the change in demand, we can change how agriculture takes place in the Southeast Asia region. The MAP framework will include the following measures of both quantitative and qualitative approaches to measure the effectiveness of the design of the restorative agrarian spaces against the following metrics, which will provide fresh insights using biological and medical methods as a basis of measuring the effectiveness of the design. The list of qualitative and quantitative methods and measurements are as follows. We are tracking the physical movement of participants. Uh, we're tracking nutritional outcomes, uh, mental engagement, and also social and economic well-being assessments. The ultimate aim is to make Singapore an edible garden city. For a landscape that is restorative and regenerative, an effort that is a whole of society approach to creating a better food future for our city. What I hope for Thailand uh, and Bangkok uh, is that I believe there's so much, well, there's so much information um, on traditions of uh, food in Thailand, uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, I, I remember being uh, in a conference uh, a few years back when I was in Thailand, uh, in Bangkok. Uh, the diversity of food um, from the villages, from the from from the rural areas, you know, eating ferns um, and and different types of forage um, produce um, is is something that I hope can be shared um, a lot more uh, in the city with the urban people, and this can also spread. Um, to places like Singapore because we share a very similar climate, right? We are in the tropics uh, and what can grow in Thailand can also grow in Singapore. I hope we can exchange knowledge in that way, also driving Thai eating cultures and habits uh, into Singapore and to use a lot more of our local plants, local endemic plants um, to create this broader urban farming movement because we are ASEAN and we are one uh, and we, we share the same space, uh, same climate and we, I hope we can do a lot more together. So thank you everyone for listening to my presentation. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and hope to see you soon, uh, either in Singapore or in Bangkok um, after this entire thing so that we can share a meal together and be on the farm together uh, to exchange more. Thank you very much.